All right, friends, it's time to give you loyal listeners a discount on protein powder. You may or may not know, but I launched my very first protein powder two years ago. It's a grass-fed beef isolate with only three ingredients, grass-fed beef, either organic cacao or organic vanilla, and organic monk fruit. Now, if you don't want any of the added flavor and sweeteners, you can also just get unflavored. And no matter what flavor you choose, you're getting over 23 grams of protein per scoop, which is gonna keep you full and satisfied between meals. I love starting my day with a Fab Four smoothie and breaking my fast with that much protein. It makes a serious difference in my cravings and blood sugar balance the rest of the day, and I've seen it with my clients as well. Now, I never thought I'd own a product company, but when I got pregnant with Sebastian, I realized the majority of protein powders were chemically extracted or enzymatically extracted, and I wanted to use heat and water only. I wanted minimal ingredients because we don't need those emulsifiers, fillers, or added vitamins, minerals, and probiotics. All of those additions increase the chances that it's not gonna work for your body, whether it be bloating, digestion issues. I just wanted pure clean protein to keep you full and satisfied so you could build the most delicious Fab Four smoothie. And I have to say, I'm pretty proud of the flavor. If you take a look at our reviews on Amazon, you'll see five-star reviews for flavor. And that is key because if you don't love your Fab Four smoothie and you don't love drinking your protein powder, you're not gonna do it. It won't become a habit and it's consistency that outpaces everything. So. If you're here and you're listening and you want to give our protein powder a try, use the code PODCAST5 for $5 off your order. And let me know if you love it. My favorite ways to apply this protein powder is in my Fab Four smoothie, making freezer fudge, making chocolate milk, making hot chocolate, and throwing the unflavored into all my kids' baked goods. So let me know how you use it. Let me know if you love it. And share this podcast deal with your friends. Taylor Dukes is a nurse practitioner and she owns a private elite health consultant company in Texas. She works with professional athletes, celebrities, and CEOs of major health companies, as well as busy mamas like herself. Her passion is not only helping sick people heal, but also helping health conscious people take their health to the next level. She wants her clients to have a deep understanding of their body and its unique individual needs. Taylor does a deep dive into her client's history and then uses tests to determine what her clients need to feel, look, and perform their best. She's the mama of a two-year-old and in just a couple weeks, she will welcome baby number two. So let's get Taylor on the show before she goes into labor. Taylor, welcome to the show. I'm so excited to have you on. And before you pop with baby number two, we got we got you in before maternity leave. Feels good. Thank you for having me. I'm honored to be here. Oh, well, you're doing some amazing things. You have a private practice where you work with clients um, as you're a nurse practitioner and you have a functional medicine background. So you work on gut health with clients. And then you also have this amazing brick and mortar store that allows the recommendations that you make for your clients to be implemented in a really fun, easy way with infrared saunas, holistic massage, IV therapy, all that really cool stuff. I kind of want to like live by you so I can just come enjoy that from being honest. <laughs> but, um, but let's start with like how you even got into all of this. Yeah, that's a great question. And I get asked that question all the time because I feel like more and more people are talking about alternative or integrative or functional medicine. And what I always tell people is you're either sick or you're smart to get into it. And I personally was not smart. I was not at the cutting edge of my nursing school class or my master's program. I was really sick and um, I was actually an ICU nurse and I did some medical mission trips. But I ended up getting really sick living in Ecuador and had to get flown back to the States. And I was an otherwise healthy girl that had graduated college, lived normal life. And um, I wasn't the sick kid growing up or anything. And it just seemed like it didn't happen overnight, but my health kind of spiraled out of control. And so I ended up not being able to work. My hair was falling out. I had joint pain, tons of stomach issues. I didn't even have like teenage acne and my face was a wreck. I mean, I've shared my before and after pictures and I just, it was awful. And so I was going to endocrinologists, gastroenterologists, rheumatologists, people were trying to figure out what was wrong. And I was doing invasive procedures. I was prescribed pills and I did it all because I didn't know better. And I felt really convicted because here I was a nurse in our healthcare system that's supposed to advocate for my patients. 
and I got so lost. I didn't know how to advocate for myself. And so um, it was a really long, hard journey that I'm really grateful for because I feel like it's all been used and purposeful for what I do now. So anyway, I got into it because I was sick. And eventually my parents were like, enough is enough. This is, we're seeing you suffer. None of this stuff seems to be working. Um, that was about after a year of tests, procedures, prescriptions. And I ended up finding a functional medicine doctor in Austin and they did a whole workup on me. And to be honest, I thought it was like woo woo. Like I was yeah. like, I, I don't believe any of this. It's not evidence-based. Like they're telling me to cut gluten out of my diet. I was like, whatever, I've been eating gluten. And uh, it literally changed my life so much so that it changed my career and the trajectory of my career. And so that's kind of how I got into it as a patient. And then I had you know, the opportunity to work for Dr. Amy Myers. A lot of people know her as kind of the autoimmune thyroid expert. And so I was her nurse for years and I just, was exposed to the clinical practice and, you know, went back to school myself and started my own private practice. And so I've never looked back since. Wow. It's amazing what can come on the other side of healing and, and just the educational journey that most patients go on when they are faced with an ailment that isn't getting better, like the band-aid prescriptions, the procedures, what ultimately were you diagnosed with or what did they find when you finally looked under the hood with a functional md yeah so that's a great question i had thyroid dysfunction i had SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth i had parasites which is gross but a lot of people have them um, i had lived in africa and ecuador um, and a lot of it rooted back to gut issues um, i really say that the gut truly is the gateway to health. And um, that caused just a lot of systemic inflammation and joint pain. And I was anemic, I wasn't absorbing food. So I didn't have any iron reserves. You know, it was just the whole slew of things. It was the perfect storm, to be honest with you. And I always say like, shy of getting in an accident, your health doesn't really decline overnight. So it's little drops in the bucket over time. And my body just kind of gave out on me. <laughs> Yeah. And it's normally when we're hitting that rock bottom or what we feel like is the end of the road where we finally go like, what is going on? I need to figure this out. So what was your road to recovery? Um, you're working with a functional MD. How did they approach your gut health or your, you know, systemic health, your whole body health in a holistic way? Yeah. So it's very similar to what I do in my practice now. It's um, a full, they listen to me for 90 minutes, which I was like, what are we even going to talk about? You know, <laughs> you go back to like, how was your mother's pregnancy? I'm like, I don't know. We need to call my mom <laughs> to, you know, nutrition and lifestyle. And um, I use a lot, they use a lot of testing to gather data to just figure out what was going on and then put me on personalized protocols specific to what was going on with my body i was able to wean off of certain medications it was appropriate for me it's not appropriate for everybody you know medications totally have their place and i even prescribe when medically necessary and i weigh out the cost benefit analysis but I was able to get off prescriptions, change my entire lifestyle. Um, I committed to going gluten and dairy free when I was like, this is bogus, but I was desperate. I truly was at rock bottom and was like, I can't live like this. I'm 22. I was taking naps in my car before walking inside my apartment at the time. I got rid of a bunch of chemicals in my environment. I mean, I just, I did a whole 180 and I don't want to say it happened to overnight, but I was so sick that I was so motivated that I did do a lot at once. And I think the encouraging part for me, and maybe I just, it was my personality and that's what I needed to stay motivated. I saw pretty quick results. Um, as you know, healing can take a long time and repairing the gut. And so my healing journey definitely took oh, oh, probably around a year, maybe a little over a year. But what was so encouraging for me and what I was so thankful for is I saw little glimpses of improvement along the way that compelled me and motivated me to say, hey, this is worth it. Like, I don't feel like I'm missing out on the, the cake or whatever because I'm feeling better and I'm not waking up with joint pain and things like that. So it definitely took time. I don't think there's any miracle cures or even gut powders or whatever. Um, but it was pretty amazing to see the power of nutrition and personalized supplementation and lifestyle. I mean, even just sleeping, my adrenals, you know, working in the ICU and my cortisol levels, just, I thought I was the Energizer Bunny and I kind of am, but <laughs> I had to slow down and let my body heal. And um, yeah, so it definitely took time, but I saw improvement along the way. That's wonderful. What were some, I know you mentioned joint pain, but what were some of those um, I want to call them like the symptoms, like the relief of symptoms that you saw that were, were so motivating and, and 
you know, I know you obviously have a private practice. What are some of the, of the things that you see are really motivating to the clients in your practice too, to get people excited? Cause it is like healing the body, especially the gut and looking at, looking at a patient in a holistic way can really take a long time. And you need someone who's going to like hold your hand or keep you motivated. But it's that it's sometimes those little things that you go, wow, wow, that's like a major change for me. And I'm willing to stick to this. What were those for you? Yeah, I remember. So when I was specifically talking to the joint pain, I remember feeling my joints and I'm like, I didn't know you could feel your joints. Like here I am this young girl and I'd wake up feeling like I was gripping a steering wheel all night, like stressed in an ice storm or something. Like I could hardly open my hands. Getting out of bed was painful. That went away pretty soon. I feel like just changing my diet and of course getting on supplements. And I'm trying to think what else did I notice pretty, it took a while for my digestive issues to improve, but I started noticing that I was less reactive to things, AKA not looking pregnant after every single meal. A big one for me was um, not taking an afternoon nap. Like, I don't want to say that I was at my peak performance energy, you know, that I am at now and what I was used to, but I started to notice like, oh, I don't feel like I have to get, have coffee to get through the day. Or, you know what, I may not have enough energy to work out, but I can clean my kitchen. It was just little things like that. And I will say like the skin took some time to improve the mental clarity. Um, you know, some of those symptoms that I experienced, my hair falling out, that took a little bit of time, but overall, I mean, those little things along the way were like, Oh, this is working. I'm going to keep doing this. It is interesting. Cause when you talk about hair and skin, it's, it's so far from the gut, like physically, like the distance between, and I always say like when it, wherever the most blood flow is, you get, can get like the fastest, a lot of times like more healing. Whereas like when you're looking at skin and hair, it's, it's like a three month to six month time frame after we've made major changes and seen some healing to then see like the glow or like the fullness and just the vitality come back. Right. Because we're, we're basically fixing everything from the inside out. Totally. And my nutrient reserve was on empty. And I always say, like, I'm just a huge gut health is everything. It was part of my story. I see it change so many people's lives. And um, just by healing the gut, you know, and correcting certain things. But I, for me personally, it was like, you're not just what you eat. So even though you're eating healthy, it's what you digest and absorb. And I wasn't absorbing things. And so, you know, just replenishing my nutrient levels, they were all so low, all my antioxidants, my B vitamins, my magnesium. And so replenishing, but also getting to the root cause of, hey, you don't have to be on a digestive enzyme for life, but you do need to heal your gut so you can digest and absorb nutrients. And then of course, so many things can affect hair from thyroid function to iron levels and I didn't have any of those things going for me. So of course I was experiencing all the symptoms. Yeah, definitely. Well, you've been able to pay it forward and work with clients and help them on their healing journeys. And I, you know, I heard you mention that you were, your nutrient reserves were low, your iron was low. Um, you had some digestive issues. Um, you had skin issues when someone's going to see a doctor. Cause it sounds like you did what most people do, which is go to a multitude of doctors in their own specific, specific specialty in their own little silo to fix your skin, then to fix your gut, then to fix your thyroid. But when you ultimately see someone who is func a functional MD or a nurse practitioner, a dietitian, they're looking at your whole body and your, and your whole life really, but they're using diagnostic tools to kind of open you know, the hood and see what's going on. What are some of your favorite ways to get a read and look under the hood with your clients? Yeah. So, you know, I do a really in-depth history and I mean, I genuinely ask people, how was your mother's pregnancy? Were you the kid that got strep throat and ear infections growing up? You know, were you chronically exposed to antibiotics? Did you have mono, any traumatic events, exposure to chemicals? So I'm doing the whole health history workup. I have them fill out really extensive forms, ask them a ton of questions. It gets really personal. Most people actually cry because they're like, I've never had someone care. Like, yeah. or they haven't even taken the time to trace their timeline to see. I mean, we're talking about root canals and, 
if they have mercury amalgams in their mouth, you know, because like you said, we see the body as a whole, it's not a group of systems. And while you might have more symptoms associated with say your hormone, your endocrine system, um, you know, it's, it's your body's working as a whole. And so that's where I use a really, really in-depth patient history, but I feel like where I kind of, what I'm known for, what I specialize in in my approach is test don't guess. And so based off of that, you know, and I have a lot of light bulbs going off in my head and correlations, and I kind of have feelings like, this is what I feel like we need to focus on, or, hey, this triggered maybe this autoimmune situation. Like I can know if certain patients, not always knowing, I, I confirm it by testing, but I'm like, this sounds like an autoimmune trigger at this event. And then we do a profile and we find they have rheumatoid arthritis, you know? But I would say when it comes to testing, I do really in-depth testing. I do traditional blood work that you would get through, say, your primary care provider or your OB, um, but it's a much larger panel. You know, we're looking at blood counts and liver and kidney and full thyroid panels, iron, inflammatory markers, autoimmune markers when appropriate. And then I also do things like food sensitivity, nutrient testing, Almost every patient walks out with a stool test. <laughs> I think yeah. it's gut health is everything. Have I said that five times already? Um, but yeah, so, you know, gut testing, I do toxic chemical profiles, heavy metal, mold, lime. I do get into that. I don't normally start there. Um, but when I have patients that are really sick, sometimes that's, you've got to rule that out. So I use a lot of testing to help, you know, one, have a good baseline, and then two, really personalized protocols. Um, you know, and sometimes finances, like it gets expensive. I get it. Sometimes I try to help people through insurance, you know, and I'll say, let's start here and see how much you improve. And then here's our plan B. So I always try to work with the patient and where they're at or how much history, you know, they have, and then, um, kind of just decide a personalized plan, everything from, you know, lifestyle to sleep, to stress, to, to nutrition. Sometimes we get into genetics, detox pathways, things like that. So it's really comprehensive. And, you know, it, I just love and appreciate that there are some of these functional medicine lab testings that can give us an overall picture at a cellular level, what's going on instead of just maybe just take this, just guess, you know, because it does get expensive. Then you end up being on the guessing train for a year and a half with maybe little to no improvement and a really restrictive diet. So right. that's my approach. I I love that you're realistic. I love that you are looking at your patient in a very individual way, but it sounds like trying to use the tests that are going to give you the most amount of information that can create the biggest changes in their life, like nutrient levels, like a stool test. What are some things that you're commonly seeing? I know everyone's different, but what have you seen a surge in any diagnosis in your practice in the last couple of years or anything that you're having a hard time treating that you think is one of those difficult diagnoses for people yeah i am um, naturally just working for dr myers I, I do see a lot of autoimmune patients specifically women a lot of autoimmune thyroid um, a lot of people that have been diagnosed with thyroid stuff, but never known it's autoimmune. And then when you go to check autoimmune panels, they might have lupus or rheumatoid arthritis. And so I definitely have seen more autoimmune. Um, I think that's naturally just because of my connection to her, but I also think that it's on the rise. It's super prevalent. So I would say a lot of autoimmune issues, a lot of gut issues, um, especially in the last year, a lot of depression, anxiety. I think part of that's just our life the last year and a half. I can't even, almost two years now. Um, but stress is huge and I it triggers so many things. And it could be, I always say, you know, it's drops in a bucket, but stress can tip the bucket over and make someone have a full-blown autoimmune flare. Um, so I've seen a lot of depression, anxiety, uh, hormonal imbalances. I feel like that's on the rise, just a ton of endocrine disrupting chemicals and overuse of certain medications. And one thing specifically gut wise um, is SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's a beast and I'm seeing it fairly often. Yeah. Well, you mentioned a few things you're seeing um, people with thyroid issues having autoimmune um, having an autoimmune component there and potentially multiple autoimmune diseases, what, what marker would a client or a patient be asking their doctor to call for if they're like, I have thyroid issues and I've been giving, given, you know, thyroid medication, but I don't know if it's autoimmune. What markers right. should they be looking for there? Yes. And I try to always teach people. I'm like, not, a, I can't work with everybody as a patient, but that's where I try to use 
blogs and social media to teach people to advocate for themselves. And so um, one of the things that I share and I'm passionate about is get a full thyroid panel. So if you're on, whether you suspect thyroid issues or whether you are on, say, just Synthroid and that's what you've been on for 20 years, you know, mm -hmm. um, I always encourage people to do a full thyroid panel. So that's a TSH, a free T4, a free T3, reverse T3, and then also add on those antibodies, which are going to show if it's, you know, Hashimoto's or the Graves type picture, um, which are autoimmune thyroid conditions. So things like thyroid peroxidase antibodies or thyroglobulin antibodies. And then another, I would say not as, there's tons of different markers that are associated with different autoimmune diseases. So it does get kind of specific, like certain inflammatory markers are associated with lupus, while others are associated with rheumatoid arthritis. But a really good general panel, if someone just suspects autoimmune issues or has a family history or just unexplainable symptoms, to be honest, it takes a long time to get an autoimmune diagnosis. So the test for that is um, an ANA, which stands for anti-nuclear antibodies. And I like ordering the one that has a reflex to the titer. So if they have any positive ANA or pattern that pops up that's suspicious, it will run a full panel um, that has markers like RF for rheumatoid factor, or you know, it, you can get more specific. So if you're positive, then it kind of shows it's an add-on test. The lab automatically does to kind of run and see what else could be going on. And are you doing that through a regular, like a Quest Diagnostics? With, yes, with the all reflux. these, okay. exactly, all these thyroid markers and the ANA with reflex to titer, they're all through Quest, LabCorp, I mean, your primary care provider, an endocrinologist, usually it'd be a rheumatologist, by that time you're waiting months to get a referral to see someone to do a workup, Right. and not all providers are willing to do that, you know, like, but I always encourage people, the least you can do is advocate for yourself. And if you suspect that, go in and say, hey, would you mind drawing this? Like my grandmother actually has lupus and my cousin has celiac. So I have autoimmune in my family. Would you be willing to do this? You know, and some providers are and some providers will challenge you and tell them that's their job and not yours and stop Googling and <laughs> yeah. I'm not saying to Google, but um, yeah, those are just things that you can get through insurance through a traditional lab. And then if you don't have insurance or provider that's willing, sometimes you can go to a place like any lab test now and pay out of pocket, um, you know, but it does help having a provider that's knowledgeable to be in your corner to help you if something were to come up and interpret those results. Right. So are you saying you can walk right into Quest and request a lab test personally as a patient without a doctor? Yes, it's really expensive. So I always tell people there's any lab test now, it's kind of a cheaper direct consumer lab situation. So you can literally Google any lab test now, find a location near you and go do a thyroid panel or mm -hmm. go do an ANA. Um, you know, so that's really helpful. You you can, I think, at Quester Lab Corp. I just think it gets super expensive. Right. And there's so many online companies that are willing to do that kind of thing now. Exactly. And get you hooked up with a virtual doctor to approve that test. Exactly. Get, it, get, get around that referral referral issue. Okay. So let's step outside of thyroid because you mentioned that and that was something, you know, that's a really common thing that I see so many clients I have are on nature's throid or synthroid and they've been on it for a while, same sort of situation. You don't really know what's happening and what's causing the problem until you get a, a full panel. Um, but then dipping into the gut side of things. So SIBO, I feel like, you know, it's one of those things where you're like, is it on the rise or has it been around, but we weren't testing as often? Um, either way, the way that it's being treated has changed. Um, when you have a client that tests positive for SIBO, can you talk about the, the different types of SIBO that someone might have, how you yeah. might treat those differently and how you incorporate um, nutritional advice on top of that and what your approach is? Yeah, you know, everybody's different. Great question. So um, SIBO stands for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and there are different types of SIBO. So depending on the type of SIBO that you have, um, there's new literature about a new kind. So I'm not going to talk about that. But the two main, you know, well-studied and researched types that we know about are hydrogen SIBO and methane SIBO. And those are the different types of gases in the small intestine that cause symptoms. So what 
as a provider, you know, when I hear things like chronic constipation or really bad diarrhea or alternating constipation and diarrhea with bloating that's horrible, especially that's worse at the end of the night, a lot of skin issues tied to it, you know, my little SIBO radar is going off. Mm -hmm. And so we'll usually start with stool testing to look at the gut. But when it comes to SIBO testing, it's um, a breath test. That's the gold standard. And so when you do that breath test, it will tell you, do you either have hydrogen SIBO or do you have methane SIBO? And with hydrogen SIBO, that's you, and you can also have a combination as well. I wanna highlight that too, you can have both, um, but the hydrogen SIBO is more, and I like to say this and I teach my patients, it's like a hydrogen bomb, it's explosive, it's the you gotta go type diarrhea, more loose stools. And then the methane SIBO is more like methane gas, smelly, foul, constipated. That's kind of the clinical picture that you see with both. So when it comes to treatment, um, I personally don't take just a one size fits all approach to SIBO. I even going a step further than treating the SIBO, I work on correcting the colon because if you're not digesting and absorbing and moving things along, um, you know, food's just going to sit and you're constantly going to have these issues. So if someone has even thyroid dysfunction, that can affect motility affecting SIBO, you know, so I do want to highlight that my SIBO approach is still looking at the colon, looking at thyroid motility, things like that. Um, but I personally sometimes use prescriptive therapy in my practice. I probably prescribe less than 10 meds, if I'm being honest, like thyroid, a few gut prescriptions. I mean, I hardly ever prescribe and use my license for that, but I do. And SIBO is one of those, those situations where I've found really great results. So um, I use a prescription called Zyfaxin um, for hydrogen SIBO. And then for um, methane SIBO, I'll use a combination of Zyfaxin and another med. Um, and so it just depends on the patient, their history. Some people don't want pharmaceuticals, and I respect that. Um, and we do a little bit longer herbal. So what I'll do is I'll sometimes do pharmaceuticals, and then I'll follow it up with an herbal protocol. Um, that's kind of a long time. Maybe motility agents, some magnesium some sun fiber, you know, they're pretty involved protocols, if I'm being honest, and can be a little bit overwhelming for patients, but when they get relief, it's a game changer. And then, um, you know, a lot of people talk about SIBO and low FODMAP diets. Um, and I personally have seen, I had SIBO myself as well. So everything I ask my patients to do, I'm like, y'all, this is hard, but I've done it and it's worth it. Yeah. So, um, and I did a low FODMAP diet and it was really restrictive and quite honestly, it was not sustainable. And so I don't expect my patients to be on a low FODMAP diet. That's just not realistic. However, it can provide symptom relief. It's just really, really hard. Um, and so I don't, I use, I sometimes implement that in therapy based off of the patient, um, but it really just depends on symptoms, their willingness, you know, things like that. Are you attacking some of those fermentable categories or sugar categories by, by removing anything else from the diet that you think encapsulates a lot of it? Or do you make, I know, I know FODMAPs is so difficult for people. It's so hard. It's so hard to, it really, and SIBO too, when they get to the end and they retest and they still have it, or, you know, they're still having symptoms. That's so frustrating because it's, it's one of those times where you're like, I just feel like crying. Like I've tried, so many of these patients have tried so hard and they aren't getting relief from their diarrhea or their constipation or, you know, what other, what others, whatever other symptoms they may be dealing with, which is really hard as a patient, right? So then they'll blame themselves because they didn't do a FODMAP diet or something, but are there any sweeping changes you're making or nutrition advice that you're giving when someone has gut health issues that you think can be beneficial to a lot of people? Yes. And it's so hard because I feel like it is so individualized based off of the person and what they can tolerate too. Um, I will say like a lot of probiotic rich foods or things like kombucha, I have my SIBO patients avoid them because it, it just irritates them. You know, um, it causes the gas to build up and cause more distension, things like that. Um, it, so it really does depend on the patient. I find a lot of SIBO patients can't actually tolerate probiotics very well. So yeah. we'll do some more spore-based probiotics, things like that towards the end of their protocol, you know, but it really just depends kind of on the person and then avoiding any inflammatory foods that they might be consuming that could be contributing. Um, but yeah, it really depends on the person. There's not this like SIBO list of foods. I feel like that would be the FODMAP diet, which I'm just like, and, and there's a time and place. And I, I tell people, I'm all for just a healthy lifestyle, not these crazy, restrictive, unrealistic diet plans because the stress of following this perfect diet can be worse for your health <laughs> than like 
eating the whatever you want to call it, you know? And so that's where I always try to be realistic, but I also have to be honest with my patients and say, Hey, there's a time and place for a nutritional and healing protocol. And I need you to commit to this. And I, I, I don't make promises, but I'm like, here's what I see when people do this. And usually you get better. And this isn't a forever thing. Um, but I also try to be realistic of like, you know what, if that's important for you to have a glass of wine at that family gathering, then like, don't be stressed out for two weeks that you're going to have to avoid wine with your uncle. And that's like a tradition that you do at Thanksgiving, you know? Right. right. But I'm there on. are some places. Right. Definitely. I, I think I'm on the same page with you on that. It, for me, it does come down when I do have a SIBO patient, it may not be as FODMAP specific, but really generally like a lot of processed foods and sugars and things that are, you know, the acellular carbohydrates, the flour based foods, we're trying to avoid those just because like when you think about the actual surface area of that stuff, coming in contact with those microbes, it can be there's just a lot of food for them. So like we're feeding. Yeah. 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 And that's where I'm like, I guess I should answer your question. I'm like, most of my patients on protocols, by the time they're with me, they're not on refined sugar. They're avoiding gluten. A lot of times they're avoiding, you know, dairy. It's inflammatory. I love eggs. I love them. They're rich in choline, amazing nutrients. Um, But sometimes people, that's where you have to just discern with each individual. Is there an allergy? Is there a sensitivity? And and even it's not even a forever thing. Sometimes it's like, hey, once we heal the gut, you can have these things, but we do have to remove some of those, like you said, like the flowers and the sugars. And sorry, I didn't mention that, but yes, the most no, of my I, are on I, nutritional I, protocols, avoiding some of those common inflammatory foods for sure. I mean, I think probably by the time they get to you, they've done a lot of the heavy lifting for that. And they're just like, I've done everything. You can't help me, but please help me. (laughs) Yeah. No, my patients are the ones that like, they're not the ones that are like, what's gluten? They're like, I've been using Branch Basics for three years. I don't use any chemicals. I, you know, have done the, this, the autoimmune paleo protocol. And some, I mean, I work with professional athletes too, that are like, I feel good. I just want to optimize my performance. I doubled my protein at Chipotle and you're like, okay, great. (laughs) Yeah. And half the supplements they're taking, I'm like, oh my gosh, these are awful. You know, I actually have some of my athletes on your protein powder. Oh, amazing. Yeah. I did. I'll have to like send you a picture, but some of them, I mean, one of them's a defensive end and a huge, huge, huge guy. And he's like, I don't know. This protein powder looks a little girly. I know. like the amino acid profile. And now he's like gotten his bros on it. So oh, I love that. That's so yeah, funny. And, I mean, I love your protein powder too. But anyway, I just, you know, it's some of these athletes that are performing at this really high level, think they feel good, but they're in chronic pain. Their amino acids are in the toilet. And so anyway. I know. It's kind of crazy to look at that, um, just to, to look at how professional athletes become professional athletes that a lot, you know, they're playing in high school, they're drinking the Gatorade, they get to college, they have an unlimited, you know, if they decide to go to college, if they make that step, they have an unlimited food budget with their, you know, cafeteria card. And it's just really about eating as much as they can and not the quality of it. And um, so it is, it is, they're lucky to have you and to have, to have that diagnostic testing, to look at their amino acid profile, to see where, see it where, you know, where the bottlenecks are for protein synthesis and things like that. Just really, really cool hacks that you get to, uh, you know, optimize, optimize. Yeah. Just it's, yeah. It, they, and those are the type of people who are using their bodies so hard that they need that kind of support. So, yeah. um, you've mentioned gut health and we, it's, it's your sweet spot. And we just chatted about SIBO, but I'm curious, someone comes to you and they've been diagnosed with leaky gut or you diagnose them with leaky gut, this is also a really big category right now, a really big diagnosis. And a lot of people have it because you'll see that they have other ailments happening in their body and you link it back to a permeable gut, intestinal permeability. Can you talk about how you diagnose leaky gut and what are some protocols to rebuilding that gut? Yeah. So, um, Leaky gut is definitely something when I heard about that, I was like, whatever, this is bogus. And now I'm like, no, there's clinical testing and measurements you can measure. And there's a lot of research about zonulin and leaky gut and autoimmunity. And so I personally do a stool test in my practice. And again, though, it goes back to history. If someone's reacting to a ton of different food, has skin issues, has had chronic gut issues, I'm like, you for sure have a leaky gut. Like sometimes I'm like, if we need to be mindful of cost, I'm going to treat you for it because it's not like the treatment that you would shy away from 
Mm -hmm. it's not dangerous or anything, but I'm just going to assume based off your symptoms, but there is an actual test. So I personally use a stool testing company um, that shows us everything from beneficial bacteria to opportunistic, also known as dysbiosis. It's an over, you know, growth of bad bacteria. It shows parasites, digestive markers, calprotectin, which is an inflammatory marker, but they also have the option. So it's a really comprehensive stool test, but there's an option to add on something called zonulin. And that is a marker for um, leaky gut, also known as intestinal permeability. And um, so I'll sometimes treat based off of history. Sometimes, you know, people need to see, and it depends on my patient. Sometimes a lot of guys, especially athletes that I work with, they want to see the data and they're motivated. Right. And once they see it and girls are just kind of like, mm, I just want to feel good and like be pretty. And like, if you can fix my skin, you know, yeah. so it depends on the patient. And sometimes they need to see that data and that marker to say, okay, this is real. Here's my protocol. So when it comes to a leaky gut type protocol, um, I'm fixing why it occurred in the first place. So is this person on chronic antibiotics or sinus infections? How can we improve their immune system? Um, are they eating a non-organic diet, glyphosate? There's a lot of research and studies showing how that can affect the microbiome. Um, so getting them to eat organic food, filtered water, things like that. You know, a lot of things that can cause it in the first place. I'm always asking the why, not just, hey, let's treat it here and now. Um, and then also chronic gut issues, things like dysbiosis and parasites and bacterial imbalances that can lead to leaky gut over time. And so always going upstream, treating the cause, looking at diet lifestyle. Um, and then as far as a protocol, say that someone had, in my case, I had two parasites. And so if I didn't get rid of the things, I could do all the gut healing powders and the collagen, everything all day long. But if I didn't get rid of those parasites that were causing the leaky gut and of course like years of antibiotics that I didn't know were affecting my gut health. I mean, I would just pop a Z-pack because I'm like, oh, I'm a little run down. Um, you know, being mindful of, hey, antibiotics have their place when necessary, but not resorting to that. And so, and I was also living abroad. I was on antibiotics to prevent malaria. That was a huge part of my story. I'm in Africa on doxycycline for over a month. Wow. And that, so it's always going upstream and, can, you know, figuring out the reason why. Um, and then, you know, in my certain case, like I did anti-parasitic herbs, I did um, digestive enzymes, you know, things to help support. And then I did a gut healing supplement that has things like zinc carnosine, uh, marshmallow extract, you know, just different gut healing, a lot of amino acids. So a lot of my patients that have leaky gut, I'll put them on you know, collagen type supplement, AKA your protein powder. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, it, it's just, it's really going back to the root cause, figuring out what caused it in the first place, correcting the imbalances. And then at the end is when I do more like probiotics and what I call the heal and seal stage. It's like, okay, let's get rid of all the pathogens. And then what a lot of people know is the five R gut protocol. You know, you remove, you repopulate with good bacteria, you replace enzymes. And then the end stage is kind of like repair and seal the gut. And I use a gut healing powder for that, um, that a lot of people do find like, wow, I actually notice a difference after that. Great. And what is the, what is the gut the stool test you're using are you using Genova or using something else? Yeah, I love Genova. I'm a Genova girl for a lot of tests. So I use different companies for different tests. I'm just particular like that. And I, yeah, have I like little, it. Like I literally love all of them. I love all my reps. Um, but I pick and choose my favorite tests and what I find to be the most valuable. And so for stool testing, I use diagnostic solutions. Um, it's the GI map. Yeah, really good. And yeah, also very visual for people, which is nice. Yes. And I just find it like really correlates with the clinical picture. And I'm always open to like every year trying new testing, comparing. I always want the best for my patients. Um, and it'd be easy to go with one lab company and get one bill a month. You know, yeah. but I'm just particular and I use a different tests for hormones than I do. I use Genova for nutrients and I love their panel and I have for years. So, yeah. but for school testing, I use the GI map. GIMF is, I think, gold standard and really easy for people to see visually if you're trying to motivate as well. Yeah. Um, which is nice. Well, let's talk about the gut powder that you're using and how you're, how you're sealing and healing. Yeah. So I really like designs for health. Um, it's the GI revive powder. It's just great. It's a broad, broad spectrum. I don't have to have people on it long-term. I love that. They also have capsules. You just have to take a lot of them. I think it's yeah. like seven. Yeah. So I'm just like, if you can throw it in a drink or something. So I really like the GI revive powder. Um, I really like 
amino acids, you know, that's super, super important for sealing those tight junctions. So collagen, yeah, uh, protein powder, uh, as well as, you know, certain probiotics based off of that person and things like that. But the gut healing powder, and then I also like, you know, ion biome, I'm not sure if you've heard of them. Um, I'll use that more for like maintenance, but more specific targeted. I really, really like the GI Revive and have had great results with it. That's amazing. Just I, I love you being so open about the diagnostic tools you're using and, and how you're sealing and healing the gut, because I think people can feel really overwhelmed, go to a functional practitioner, do a bunch of testing then be handed a box worth of supplements. And they don't really understand, okay, why am I doing this? What, what am I trying to heal or what am I trying to seal? And how is it going to work? Because you need that motivation, but it also needs to be targeted so that they don't feel overwhelmed by the number of supplements that they're taking. How do you kind of control for that um, to get, I, I guess, to, to ensure that your patients are following through? Yeah. So, and that's, I think that's key. I think that's so important that you even brought this up because certain personalities are going to be like, I'll take 20 supplements a day. I have my pill organizer. I'll set my phone alarm. And certain personalities are like, uh, okay, this sounds good. And they go home and they want to cry and like, just throw it in the closet, you know? And so that's where I, as a practitioner, always try to gauge. And I'm just super real with my patients. I'm like, what do you want to focus on? If we need to take this in stages or financially, where are you at? Um, you know, and then the other thing too, like, are you going to take pills throughout the day? Do we need to focus more on morning supplements? Do we need the custom med packs that you put in your purse? Um, so I really try to work with the patient and make it realistic for them. Uh, I always try to emphasize that this is a healing protocol. My goal is not to have you on a million supplements long-term. We're going to bridge the gap of deficiencies. And I don't do like heavy metals and nutrient and gut and everything at once. Like a lot of times if someone's biggest issue is hormones, then maybe that's where we're starting. But a lot of times hormones and adrenals, all of that falls into place when you address the bigger things. So it just depends on the person um, and really gauging like where they're at, where the priority of the protocol is, what is realistic. So if some people, I always usually ask, hey, are you a smoothie person? Because if we can just throw a bunch of things in a smoothie and that's gonna get you to check off that list, awesome. You know, yeah. and then also considering lifestyles, like I work with a lot of entrepreneurs, CEOs, my athletes, you know, like they have very crazy schedules. And so really figuring out like what's realistic nutrition wise, how can you get access? Do you need someone to meal prep for you? Um, you know, and so it, it's not just supplements, it's the lifestyle aspect. And then sometimes I have to have really honest conversations because if people aren't willing and motivated to do it, I can only do so much. I can do the in-depth testing. I can tell them what's wrong. I can tell them the protocol, give them their playbook, so to speak. Um, and sometimes they have to be willing to take that next step. And sometimes it's a motivating pep talk. Sometimes it's, you know, I can't, I, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't force it to drink. I will say most of my patients are motivated for sure. But there's always that person where it's like, you know, there's a mental block for whatever reason. And maybe, maybe counseling, or maybe I'm like, you know what? Just focus on nutrition and just start there and the supplements can come later. So I feel like it's always gauging where the person's at. But generally speaking, most of the people that I work with, I'm fortunate, they're motivated, they're willing, they've been to other providers, they've done their research and they're, they're in. So yeah. Definitely. Well, I love, I really do appreciate and respect that you're meeting them where they are, talking about finances, and trying to gauge what's doable for someone. Um, you mentioned that you didn't like having patients on supplements for life. Um, do you have any supplements that you think are almost like insurance that you like to see people taking? Yeah, I think and I'll speak for myself too. Like I, I'm healthy. I'm generally healthy. I mean, I have a glass of wine. I have my dark chocolate. Like I go on vacation, right? I live, like I don't have gut issues and all these issues anymore. So I want to emphasize too, like when I am home and I'm cooking, it's generally healthy. We don't use a lot of chemicals. Um, but even though I live a very healthy lifestyle, our nutrient and soil is just not as rich as it used to be. And so you know, multivitamins are great. Some sort of minerals are great. I just find a lot of people are deficient. Um, a lot of women are deficient in magnesium, so I don't want to tell every woman to take magnesium, but it's a relatively cheap supplement that is a cofactor for a lot of different processes and people notice a difference. Yeah. Uh, I call it my drug. I don't do drugs or take prescriptions, but <laughs> magnesium is like my, yeah. my thing. 
so multivitamins, minerals, a lot of women are deficient in magnesium, like I said, prenatals, you know, throughout pregnancy, um, certain stages of life too. Um, omegas are really great. Hair, skin, nails, inflammation benefits, cardiovascular benefits, even kids. Like I give my two-year-old an omega a couple of times a week. Uh, we healed his eczema naturally. And I swear that was part of it, you know, just Absolutely. the omega aspect. And so omegas, probiotics can be helpful. I don't think people need to be on probiotics year round. Um, I think eating a, a diet that is has diversity and soluble fiber to help grow our good gut bacteria. But I think probiotics a couple times a year is fine. Um, I'm trying to think what else. I think it just depends on the person. But I would say, generally speaking, like multivitamin, omega, probiotic, vitamin D can be helpful as well. Just a general baseline supplement too. We have all basically the same little, little five finger basics there. That's just, yeah. that just kind of ensures that you can have a little fun on vacation. Maybe you had a little fried food and you're like, I've got my omega threes or, you know, you, you need your magnesium because like you said, a lot of us are deficient and it's, it's something that you can feel whether that's you know, just energy, constipation, things of that nature. So amazing. Well, you are, you are rounding third on your second baby. Um, and so I'm curious what and how you're take care, taking care of yourself personally in your third trimester and how you plan to take care of yourself in postpartum. Yeah. Well, I don't do it perfectly or have it all figured out. I will definitely say it's a lot being a working mom. I, you know, I own the wellness center as well as my private practice and I, you know, do some online courses and it's, it's definitely a lot for me to slow down because I love what I do. Um, but for me personally, like I even stopped taking new patients six months ago to prepare for my maternity. Now I see my follow-ups. I have a full-time physician assistant, but you know, a lot of this third trimester prep happened months ago, um, just to prepare myself, you know, I'm taking my prenatal, I, I eat healthy, I drink my smoothies, you know, um, I'm really big on getting rest and listening to your body. And even though I thrive and have a lot of energy and I'm a go-go girl, um, it's just so important. And so allowing my body to rest, I'm not used to like I want to sit on the couch for 30 minutes at the end of the night. That's just like not me. Um, but taking a bath and implementing some of that self-care, it's, it's also hard. And as you know, I have a two-year-old and it's just your time isn't always your time. And so just resting where I can, eating nutrients. Um, I'm doing a natural birth again, Lord willing, at a birthing yeah. center where I delivered my son. And so my doula came over last night. We did some prep. You know, I go to pelvic floor physical therapy, I go to the chiropractor and, you know, I've kind of just been preparing in some of those ways and doing my little, my little exercises. And, um, but I, I will say focusing on stress relief, making sure I have time for myself outlets, even if that's 15 minutes outside in the morning with my feet in the grass, like that sounds crazy, but it's grounding and it's, I can start my day. Um, or, you know, if that's going to bed at 9 PM, cause I'm listening to my body after a long day. So those are kind of all the things that I'm doing just personally and professionally. Cause you know, when you're a working mom, your businesses are your babies too. Nothing compares to your children, but just kind of focusing on slowing down and listening to my body and preparing. I love it. I, I do think that setting time aside and having a practitioner, whether it's a doula or a chiropractor appointment, having those things on the books can really help you schedule that time in for yourself. But one of the biggest takeaways is going to bed at 9 p.m. If I if if 90% of my clients or you know the vast majority would just tune into that and put themselves to bed a little bit earlier they see so much more healing. And I think that's really where the rubber hits the road and you're doing it personally, which is, I commend you because it's a really hard thing to do when you're an entrepreneur, a working mom, you know, you have another baby on the way, but you have a toddler that needs a lot of your time. And I'm sure your husband too. So just tuning into that and saying like, I don't need to be on my phone. I don't need to be on Netflix. I don't need to be on my computer. Yes. I have a billion things I could do, but I need to go to sleep. Like and be so much more productive and feel so much better, greater insulin sensitivity, all the good stuff. So way to tune into that. Obviously you're, you're practicing what you preach. I try. I'm not perfect, but I've definitely seen the value of it as a patient. And I'm like, I want to wake up and feel good and have energy and mental clarity. And I know that that comes with a lot of lifestyle things. It absolutely does. Well, what advice do you have um, for the 
listeners today on how, if they are dealing with some kind of ailment, how they can search out a functional medicine practitioner and what questions should they be asking to just make sure it's the right person. Yeah. I would say for anyone listening, if you guys are experiencing just any symptoms you don't heard by your provider or you feel like you're trying to piecemeal health history together, I definitely think it's a good idea to work with a functional medicine provider, whether that's a naturopath or a registered dietitian. You know, if you need something like a thyroid prescription, you might want to seek out credentials that can prescribe, um, but not uh, that's not always necessary. And so I would say if you know that that's you, um, do research uh, for someone locally or try and get a referral from someone that, you know, might be into that. And I would say the biggest thing is never stop advocating for yourself because you might have all these symptoms and even have been told you're crazy or that things are normal based off of blood draws. But if you and your gut know that something is not right, um, you know, and I don't go down and pull hole because that can lead you to scary places, but never stop advocating for yourself and don't settle for feeling like, oh, this is just the way it is. This is how I'm supposed to feel postpartum. Um, that's a lot of moms fall into that trap, you know, just because they're tired and they're kids. But just if you feel like something's off, press into that, advocate for yourself. As far as finding a provider, ask for recommendations, read reviews, see if they're they're familiar with conditions that you feel like if if they don't have gut experience, but they're like the hormone person, they may not be the person for you. So find someone that is experienced in your um, specific set of symptoms or conditions you might've been diagnosed with. I like ifm.org. It's a good resource to search for functional medicine providers near you. Um, there are certain credentials and certifications that people can look for. And um, yeah, just, I would say, just don't give up stay encouraged, remain hopeful, and just never stop advocating for yourself. And sometimes that does look like listening to podcasts and, you know, reading blogs and, and following people that, you know, not that you should get all of your advice from social media, but maybe different people that could provide valuable insight to help you advocate for yourself. Yeah. Education can really help us advocate. Once we have those terms in, you know, our language, whether that be SIBO or dysbiosis, we can start to ask the questions and really gauge whether that practitioner is as well versed and can really support the, I, the you know, the plethora of issues a lot of us have when we first get started with functional MD. Yeah. Taylor. Don't wait till you're sick. Like, be yeah. proactive. If your body's smart. Oh. <laughs> be, no, be smart, not sick, right? Exactly. Yes. <laughs> you are not sick. And, and if your body's speaking to you, don't let it start screaming to you. I had to let my body scream to me when it was like full blown symptoms. But if your body's starting to speak up with little symptoms, press into that, listen to that. Don't ignore it. Don't suppress it. Symptoms are a gift because it's our body talking to us. So just listen. Definitely. Taylor, you are a breath of fresh air. I'm so excited for baby number two for you. I'm really proud of you for having boundaries around taking on new patients because I know I'm sure you have them knocking down your door, but it's going to allow for you to have some downtime during postpartum. I can't thank you enough for being so transparent about the tools that you're using and um, the diagnostic tools that you're using and the supplements that you're using and the things that you're looking for. These are the kind of conversations that really help people get to the root cause of their issue. And like I said, be educated in a space where they can go to their practitioner and really understand if that person can help them. So thank you for your time today. Where can people find you? Where can they follow along? What do you have to offer? Thank you for having me. So I, I have a website, taylordukeswellness.com, and I do have a blog with tons of valuable information. I can't obviously take on everybody patient, but I do try to use that as an educational platform and provide research and things that we stock in our natural medicine cabinet. You know, I try to educate people and empower them. Um, so definitely on my website or on Instagram, Taylor Dukes Wellness. And I really do. I try to educate people and, and encourage them in their journeys and just give practical, helpful tips. And that's exactly what you do. You are such a fun follow. So thanks for being here, Taylor. I will put everything in the show notes, you guys. Come check it out. Give Taylor a follow. Thank you for listening to Be Well by Kelly. Please subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Learn more at bewellbykelly.com and follow me on Instagram at bewellbykelly. I would love if you picked up my books, Body Love and Body Love Every Day. They're sold on Amazon and at all major booksellers. 